Lakin Riley was a 22-year-old nursing student who was just murdered by an illegal alien from Venezuela in Athens, Georgia last week. How in the world does this happen? How do we prevent it? from happening in the future. Also, MSNBC says that believing that your rights come from God is very problematic. We've got all of that and more on today's episode of Relatable, which is brought to you by our friends at Good Ranchers. Go to goodranchers.com. Use code Allie at checkout. That's goodranchers.com. Code Allie. Hey guys, welcome to Relatable. Happy Tuesday. Hope everyone is having a great week so far. Go listen to yesterday's encouraging conversation if you haven't already. It is such a good reminder. People's testimony, especially yesterday's testimony, such a good reminder that it is impossible to be outside the realm of God's redemption. You're not too far gone. You're not too far off. God can do anything. Some of the most encouraging words in the Bible you read in several places, but I think of Ephesians 2, but God, but God. It seems like we were too far off. It seems like we were hopeless. It seems like we were destitute and in a place of total despair, but God, through the power of his Holy Spirit, the power of Christ, he can do anything and save anyone. So praise God. If you just need a reminder of that, that God is working in and around and through and above all the craziness of what's going on in the world to win people to himself, go listen to yesterday's episode. So edifying for me personally. I know it will be for you too. All right. We have so much to talk about. I know I say that every day, but we really do. I'm going to try to go as quickly as possible through these stories because I got so much to say on everything that's going on, the good, the bad, the ugly, and all of that. But no guarantees, as you guys know, being concise is not necessarily my biggest strength. First, before we get into some of these stories, we've got some announcements. Uh, Debatable. Our series, our new series that is going to be only for Blaze TV subscribers. Our first episode is coming up. It's premiering March 4th. That's really soon. That's next week. March 4th. Debatable with Ali Beth Stuck. We've got Trent Horn. So many of you, my Catholic listeners, have been asking me to have him on. He's a Catholic apologist. Then we've got Dr. James White, who is a Protestant apologist, and they will be debating Catholicism and Protestantism. It was such a good conversation. Guys, it's two hours long, and it's two hours that you don't want to miss. It was so interesting. I mean, my wheels were just turning the whole time. I had so many questions for both of them. And so you guys are going to love it. I know that whether you're a Protestant, whether you are a Catholic, whether you don't even know where you stand with all of this, you are going to learn something from this conversation. And we just, we need that kind of polite and productive and constructive dialogue, especially within, uh, within Christianity and between Catholics and Protestants. So Subscribe. If you go to blazetv.com slash Allie, you can use code Allie for $30 off. This is a deal for a limited time and you get access to all of the other subscriber exclusive stuff. It's really important for us to put this content behind the paywall for Blaze TV subscribers because it protects us from the censors. If we've got content on Blaze TV that cannot be taken down that can't be removed by the censors, then that protects us. It protects you. It allows us to say the things that we need to say. It allows you to hear the things that you need to hear without worrying about what YouTube and, uh, you know, uh, Apple and Twitter and Facebook meta, what they're going to do. So make sure you subscribe, blazetv.com slash Allie and use code Allie for $30 off. Also, We've got a restock of merch, AllieMerch.com. We've got our Do the Next Right Thing in Faith with Excellence and For the Glory of God t-shirts, AllieMerch.com. We've got restocks of all the colors. This is our most popular design by far over the past couple of years of merch that we've been putting out. So if you missed it the last round, go ahead and uh, snag your t-shirt. We've got lots and lots of amazing brand new merch coming out in the next few months with some of the sayings that you guys love the most. We've taken a lot of your input in your suggestions for merch. Um, And we have created some really, really fun stuff that I'm so excited to show y'all in the coming months. All right, 
that's it for announcements, right, Bree? We got any more announcements? Okay, that's it for announcements. Let me just go ahead. I'll tell you about our first sponsor, then we'll get into all of this craziness. The first sponsor is We Heart Nutrition. Guys, I love this company. They create wholesome supplements, and they're a company that also has wholesome values. Unlike some of these major supplement companies like Unilever, Bayer, Pfizer, these own these multivitamin uh, companies like Ollie, Smarty Pants, One a Day, uh, uh, We Heart Nutrition is pro-life. They love the Lord. They love America. They share the same principles that you and I do. Some of these major supplement companies, they believe in the opposite. They're supporting Planned Parenthood, the politicians that are supporting the butchering of children. We just don't want to send our money there if we can help it. So get your multivitamins from We Heart Nutrition. Not only do they have our values, but also they really care about every single ingredient that goes into their supplements. All of their ingredients come in the most bioavailable forms. I've been using the same supplements um, from the same supplement company for several years. I recently switched to We Heart Nutrition. I can really tell a difference. And I'm so thankful for how it makes me feel, especially in the months of this postpartum period. I feel like it's just made such a big difference in my health. So go to weheartnutrition.com. Use code Allie for 20% off. Weheartnutrition.com. Code Allie. Weheartnutrition.com. Code Allie. Okay, let's get into it. You guys probably saw me post about this on Instagram, maybe on X over the weekend. I was and am very, very fired up about this story. That's the story of Lakin Riley, a 22-year-old nursing student at Augusta University. She was found in a forested area near the UGA intramural fields around noon on February 22nd, uh, brutally murdered. This story um, hits close to home. Of course, any story of any person murdered is absolutely tragic, deserves our compassion, our care, our attention. Um, But some stories, because of the details, either the location or the details of the person involved, they just hit a little bit closer to home than other stories because you have a personal tie. And I have a personal tie here to Athens, Georgia. It's where I moved after college. I went to college in Greenville, South Carolina. I moved about an hour and a half away to Athens, Georgia, took my first job there in PR. That's where I met my husband. That's where uh, we got married. That's where we spent the first few years of our marriage. We have visited there several times in the last few years. We absolutely love Athens and it's where my husband went to school he went to UGA and many people in his family throughout the generations went to UGA I first started um, doing what I do there in Athens by going to the sorority houses on Millage Avenue and telling the sorority girls there back in 2015 why it was so important for them to vote I uh, have such fond memories of um, of Athens and have such a connection to the university there just because of the formative years that I spent in the area. And so I know that this has rocked that community. And I know um, that this is going to continue to make waves there, not just locally in Athens, uh, but also in the state of Georgia. And as we'll talk about, this has really become a national story because of who perpetrated this uh, murder against this young woman, Lake and Riley. He happens to be an illegal from Venezuela who had a violent record who crossed the border several years ago, made his way to New York, was charged with the assault of a minor there, but was let out of jail because that's always what happens. And then at some point, he made his way to Athens, Georgia, and he killed this young woman just the other day. Now, how in the world did this happen? If you are not familiar with Athens, if you're not familiar with Georgia, you might just be thinking, well, This is a conservative state. They've got a Republican governor. And yeah, of course, like a lot of red states, maybe it's turned a little purple over the years. But 
it's generally conservative. And maybe you're thinking this is, you know, a southern SEC school. Athens is probably a conservative town. Why would this illegal alien make his way to somewhere like Athens, who surely uh, is not friendly to people like him, to illegal aliens? Um, But the fact is, is that Athens has become extremely liberal. It's become, for lack of a better word, like every other progressive city, it's become a liberal hellhole. It has become markedly less safe, poorer, and dirtier, and less stable. They've got a progressive DA there who does what progressive DAs do in every other city across the country. They're soft on crime in the name of social justice, especially if you have a particular intersectional identity, like you're an illegal alien or you are of a certain melanin count that qualifies you as what progressives deem oppressed. Um, So that's what has happened to Athens. It is much worse. It is much more disgusting than it was when I was there right after college. You know, college towns always have some sort of grunge to them. Like, I mean, they're always going to kind of smell like beer and other liquids, but um, there's also a charm to them. I never felt unsafe in Athens, even, you know, late at night. And I, I never felt like I couldn't walk to my car by myself. I never felt like my friends and I, you know, had to look over our shoulder when we were downtown. Um, but now it is different. And that's what happens with every liberal city. I don't understand. I really don't understand how people can't make that connection between progressive policies and how awful progressive cities have become. Every single city that is run by Democrats has been run to the ground, especially over the past few years. Because in the name of social justice, the people in charge have decided not to enforce the law when it comes to crimes, when it comes to drugs, when it comes to homelessness. So whether you're talking about Athens, Georgia, or you're talking about Atlanta, or you're talking about Denver, or Portland, or Seattle, or San Francisco, or D.C., or Chicago, or Philadelphia, or New York City, or Austin, I mean, I could go on and on. Every city that is run by Democrats becomes unsafe and un livable. And that is exactly what is come uh that what has become of Athens, Georgia. Unfortunately, Athens, Clark County, is one of three sanctuary areas in the state of Georgia. One of three sanctuary areas in the state of Georgia. Now, what does it mean to be a sanctuary city? It typically means that you are not going to comply with ICE. That you if ICE says, hey, we know that you've got this illegal alien He's dangerous. He is in your area. We need you to hold him. Or if he commits a crime um, and he goes to jail in this area, this uh, the district, the sanctuary district or the sanctuary city will not inform ICE of that or they will ignore uh, ICE's detainer orders saying, hey, if ICE says, hey, you got to hold this guy, the sanctuary city will say, no, thanks. They'll release him back into the public. And very often um, he will commit uh, he will commit a heinous crime. That's exactly what seems to have happened here with Lakin Riley. So just a few more details about this. Officials said that her body was found after one of her friends called 911 to report that she hadn't come home from a jog. According to an incident report, an officer found her in the woods beaten to death 30 minutes after they believe the murder took place. Police have arrested 26-year-old Jose Antonio Ibarra of Venezuela as the suspect in the crime. Ibarra faces charges of malice, murder, felony, murder, aggravated battery, aggravated assault, false imprisonment, kidnapping, hindering a 911 call, and concealing the death of another. Law enforcement confirmed that Ibarra and his brother Diego were in the U.S. as illegal immigrants. I'm just going to say a note on this. You know, my language has kind of changed over the years. My dad actually pointed out, you guys know my dad, he's been on the show several times, and he calls me multiple times a week to give me feedback on the show. And one thing that he has said is, why do you, why are you saying migrants now? (laughs) And I guess I just kind of imbibed the media's language and their change in rhetoric about it. He was like, they're not migrants. They're not just migrating. They are illegal aliens. You could say illegal 
immigrants. And I think that's correct. I think that we do need to be very careful about our language. And so I actually think illegal alien is probably just the most accurate language. Um, So he is an illegal alien and his brother, Jose Antonio Ibarra, was previously arrested, as I mentioned earlier, in New York last August and charged with endangering a child, but was cut loose before immigration officials could file a request for local cops to hold him in custody. That's, of course, what sanctuary cities do. Uh, He was also arrested for shoplifting in an Athens Walmart uh, last October. Then a warrant was issued for his arrest when he failed to appear in court regarding the incident. But, of course, nothing happened. So uh, let's learn a little bit about Lake and Riley, this 22-year-old nursing student. Her life uh, ahead of her seems like a a wonderful, sweet young woman. Uh, She was first enrolled in the UGA before transferring to Augusta University to complete her nursing degree. That's very very common there. She was a standout athlete and student at River Ridge High School where she ran cross-country and track. Um, This is what her family says. Lakin was an amazing daughter, sister, friend, and overall person in general. Her love for the Lord is exemplified in every aspect of her life. She will be missed every day, but we promise to honor her life moving forward in a very big way. During this most difficult time, we ask that you respect our privacy and provide us the time and space necessary to grieve our daughter's life that was tragically cut short. Um, Her Woodstock City Church, that's where her family went to church. They said, we are devastated by the news of the tragic death of Lake and Riley. Lake and family are active members of our church community. Our prayers are with them. Um, Our prayers should be with them, too. Absolutely pray for her family. I mean, I cannot imagine the pain of losing a child. I cannot imagine the pain. There's got to be, honestly, no worse pain in the world. And so pray for her parents, pray for her friends, pray for this community that God would somehow be glorified through this. And it sounds like she was a believer. And so she is fully healed and she is with Jesus and she is happier and more satisfied and more joyful than we could ever even imagine. She is not missing what is happening here on earth. So in that we can rejoice and that we will all All of us who are believers will see her one day, and we can absolutely thank the Lord for that. But we still mourn her death here. I mean, Jesus wept at the death of Lazarus, and no one knows more than Jesus the beauty and the glory of eternity in heaven. And so it is right and normal for us to be sad about death. Death is and will always feel unnatural to us because it was not supposed to be this way. It is because of the fall that we have to endure the sadness and the tragedy and the separation uh, that physical death causes. And so it is not only right for us to mourn for those reasons, uh, but it is also right for us to be angered because this was a preventable murder. Let us remember this, is that every single crime Every instance of manslaughter, rape, assault, theft, and murder committed by an illegal alien was preventable. Not every single crime is preventable, although I think a lot of crimes could be better deterred than they are right now just by enforcing the law swiftly and consistently and harshly when called for. But every single crime committed by an illegal alien is preventable by simply enforcing immigration law the way that so many other countries do. We like to act like this is some complex, complicated, nuanced, gray, impossible issue. The fact of the matter is we do not have political leaders on the right or the left with the will to do what needs to be done. Republicans theoretically are better on this than Democrats, but really what have they accomplished? What have they accomplished when it comes to deportations? What have they accomplished in protecting women like Lake and Riley from the predation of illegal aliens who are coming from places that, quite frankly, are run by anarchy? We cannot expect um, people like this. I'm not talking about every illegal alien. I'm certainly not talking about all immigrants by any means. But we cannot, cannot expect people like this who were very likely criminals back home to and who lived in a world of anarchy that was run by corruption and crime to come here and all of a sudden become freedom-loving, peaceful, uh, productive citizens. It's just not going to happen. I'm, I'm sorry. It's just not. I think that we believe that they're just going to assimilate because everyone is basically the same and has like the same goals and values. That's just not true. 
not every culture is the same. Not every country shares the same values. Not all people are the same. Not all people want the same things. Not all people are motivated in the same way. Not everyone coming here is just looking for a better life. They're coming here to mooch off of the most productive and responsible and best citizens among us. I mean, this is what this is what happens, not just with illegal immigration, but also just with social justice in general. The very best people in our society, like Lake and Riley, are forced uh, to sacrifice themselves for the very worst people in our society, people like Ibarra. That's what social justice is. That's what social justice policy in action looks like. It means the very worst, the most criminal people in society sacrificing the most responsible and the best people in our society. That's exactly what happens with illegal immigration in general as well. So what could have been done specifically to prevent this? How in the world did this happen? How did this person get over the border to New York City, to Athens, and was able to commit this horrendous crime and to murder this young woman? Uh, Did the officials not just in Athens, but in Georgia, do they really do what they needed to do to protect its people? We'll get into that in just a second. Let me pause. Let me tell you about our next sponsor for the day. That's Adele Natural Cosmetics. Adele Natural Cosmetics is a family-run, holistic, handcrafted, and toxin-free cosmetic company where all of their products are made in the USA. I love this family so much. They are unapologetically pro-life, and they started Adele Natural Cosmetics several years ago out of just a sincere desire to have makeup products and skincare products with completely natural and holistic ingredients. Arlene, the owner of Adele Natural Cosmetics, she had a series of health problems about 20 years ago when she started thinking even more about not just what she put puts in her body, but also what she puts on her body. And so she started creating her own makeup and creating her own uh, facial cleanser and moisturizers, and then it turned into this amazing company, and I love them so much. I use Adele Natural Cosmetics on a daily basis. When I'm not in the studio, I wear uh, their makeup. I love their cream blush and their cream foundation. It's just the right amount of coverage. I use their essential cleanser and moisturizer every day. It's been such a game changer for my skin. If you go to AdeleNaturalCosmetics.com and use code Allie, you'll get 25% off for your first time purchase. That's Adele, naturalcosmetics.com, code Ally. Adele, naturalcosmetics.com, code Ally. All right, so this is what ICE has to say. Um, they confirmed that the U.S. Customs and Border Protection first arrested Ibarra on September 8, 2022, after he illegally entered the U.S. near El Paso. But he was paroled and released for further processing, apparently because they didn't have enough room. Now, whose fault is that? Whose fault is that? Who gave the incentives to these aliens to cross the border, first of all? And why were these detention centers so over flooded with these people who have been incentivized to come here? And then why was the policy for someone like this to just be released into the interior of the United States without any further processing whatsoever for him to commit a series of heinous crimes? Whose fault is that? I mean, it's probably a lot of people's fault, but ultimately... It's Biden's fault. Ultimately, it's Mayorkas' fault. I mean, they have done everything possible to encourage the immigration of the world's worst people, not just from South America, not just from Mexico, also from China, also from the Middle East. They're coming here uh, not for a better life, guys, okay? They're not asylum seekers. They're not refugees. You know, there's a legal process that you go through to be a refugee or to be an asylum seeker, right? And if you truly are seeking refuge, if you truly are seeking asylum, you're going to go to the next safest country. So if you're in the Middle East or you're in China, America is not the next safest country. If you're in a country like Georgia, America is not the next safest country. If you are really looking for refuge and asylum, you do not come through Mexico to the southern border. That is not the safest thing to do. No, but they're coming to America because they see our leadership. And our leadership says, we're not going to do anything about this. You can come in and you can mooch off everyone else. You can get on welfare. You can commit 
horrible crimes. You'll be released from prison. You'll get to bop around to all these different sanctuary cities. You'll get to live it up. And you know what I think really just shows this, represents this? We'll put this picture up on the screen. I saw uh, this side-by-side photo of when Ibarra was originally arrested back in 2022 and then what he looks like today. So you can see what he looked like in 2022. You see what he looks like today. Look how fat he has gotten. And I'm not just trying, I'm not just like making a superficial um, slight against him. I'm not just trying to offend him. But this is what you get to do. This is what you get to do if you're from Venezuela or you're from another country. You get to cross into the United States illegally and you get to get fat. You get to um, take the resources and take the spoils of everyone else's hard work and you get to pillage this country without producing anything, without paying anything any taxes. The fact that we can have an illegal alien here who gets fat after being here for two years and then takes his final bow by murdering a 22-year-old nursing student. I mean, are we even a country at this point? Are we even a country at this point? In order to be a country, you have to have sovereignty. That is definitionally what it means to be a country. And in order to have sovereignty, you have to have parameters. You have to have a definition, right? Like you are not a country. You do not have sovereignty if you can't even define where the country is on the map. And at this point, I'm not even sure that the lines, the parameters of the United States really mean anything. They're completely flexible and they're completely porous. So That's what happens. That's what happened with this young man who has now become um, a murderer. So he was arrested, as I said, last October. He was released. According to News Nation correspondent Ali Bradley, Diego Ibarra entered the country uh, illegally twice, actually. Um, So it wasn't just uh, it wasn't just that one time. And, you know, I was talking to one of you on Instagram and you are a Venezuelan immigrant here legally and you have family um, back home in Venezuela. And I've heard this from several immigrants from Venezuela here who say that um, their family back in Venezuela are actually kind of happy about the immigration situation here in the United States because the streets are safer in Venezuela than they are here because what is Maduro doing He is sending all of the violent criminals in Venezuela to the U.S. border. So that's what's going on here. This is according to the Western Journal. The Department of Homeland Security has reportedly verified that the Venezuelan government is releasing violent criminals from its prisons and sending them to the United States. Randy Clark, a 32-year veteran of Border Patrol, wrote a piece for Breitbart detailing a then-recent DHS intelligence report received by the Border Patrol instructing agents to look for Venezuelan inmates. The report indicated that Maduro was purposely freeing inmates, though the report did not specify that the release could be a purposeful geopolitical move specifically specifically intended to impact U.S. national security. Well, what does it matter? I mean, it is obviously uh, impacting security. This was apparently confirmed in 2022. The DHS confirmed that the Venezuelan government is emptying its prisons and sending, again, the worst of the worst people um, to the United States. Is that what happened here? Not totally sure. Back in 2022, Bill Malugan, I would say that he is the foremost reporter of what's going on at the border. He's with Fox News. He reported a couple of years ago, good morning from Eagle Pass, Texas, where another large group of approximately 200 plus migrants just crossed illegally onto private property. Almost all of them are single adults, mostly from Venezuela. Somebody hung a, Venez- hung a Venezuelan flag on the barbed wire fence built by Texas here. Isn't it interesting? Like, You see this with a lot of these communities. They come here and they still have way more pride for their home country that they apparently had to flee because of danger and destitution than they do for America, uh, the country to which they should be extremely grateful. And so I just want to like I I just want to say something that I know is controversial Um, in addition to the controversial statements that I've already made about the fact that. There are different cultures in the world. 
There are different kinds of individuals. Not all cultures are the same. Not all cultures are equally good. Not all cultural practices are equally moral. Not all people have the same values. Not all people have the same goals. This kind of like neocon, I would call it, or maybe neoliberal mentality of everyone in the world has this same like burning desire for freedom. I once believed that and we're all essentially the same. Yes, we are all made in the image of God. That's true. We are all equally dead in sin apart from Christ. That's true. But cultures are different. America is unique. Uh, Western civilization is uniquely Christian with uniquely Christian values, like the dignity of human beings, like the right to private property, um, like uh, the idea of innate rights coming from God. Most people in the world and throughout history have no concept of any of those things. And so here is the here's the controversial point that I am going to make to build on that. People of different nationalities and different cultures and different ethnicities um, and different kinds of backgrounds cannot have never lived together peacefully for long without some kind of trans, uh, transcendent value system, transcendent common, uh, common belief system. It just has never happened. It's never happened ever happened. Diversity for diversity's sake has never worked. It always ends in discord. It always ends in bloodshed. It always ends in tribalism. This pie in the sky idea that I think a lot of Christians have that, oh, we should, uh, we can be like this multicultural mosaic and all live in peace without like the transcendent unity of the gospel. No, that's impossible. The only place that that is going to be possible is in the new heaven and the new earth when we are all united under the reign of Jesus. And it has been possible in the past in the United States because of this uniting transcendent idea that we are made in the image of God first. We all have equality there. We all are of equal value. And then we're all Americans. But now we don't have those uniting values anymore. So diversity is not only not our strength, it's actually our weakness now. Because we're just assuming that everyone who comes here wants to assimilate and shares ultimately our same values. They don't. Many don't. A lot do. Those, of course, are, I think, who come here legally they're some of the best people in the world. Some of the best and godliest people in my life have immigrated from places like Africa. They came here illegally. They did it the right way. They care so much about American freedom and Christian values and all of that. So this is not an indictment of Im immigrants in general. I'm just saying we can't assume that everyone who comes here wants the same things that we want. And we just have to reckon with that. That is part of human nature. That is part of human history. And so America has every right to retain a national identity, just as Zimbabwe does, just as Mexico does, just as Venezuela does, just as Canada does. Every single country has that right. But at this point, I, I'll just ask again, like, are we even a country? Do we even have a shared national identity? Like, what does it even mean to be in America, uh, be an American at this point when really all we are? is, uh, I don't know, uh, uh, a tax farm for our elites uh, to use our hard-earned money to spend it on their pet projects, both here and abroad, a place where some of the worst criminals in the world can come and strip us of our resources? Is that what it means to be an American now? And if you even talk about an American identity, you're told that some kind of racist dog whistle Everyone else in the world gets to be patriotic and care about what it means uh, to be a Kenyan or what it means to be Japanese or what it means to be Chinese. But if you talk about what it actually means to be an American, all of a sudden you're an evil bigot. And I think that's not only illogical, I think it's immoral. And quite frankly, I think it's unbiblical. I think God gave us borders. He gave us the idea of countries. He gave us the idea of languages. He created human beings. Yes, again, all made in his image, but we are different and we need order. We don't function in chaos well. And this murder is a consequence of that chaos. It's a consequence of that anarchy. It is a consequence of dis 
order. It is a consequence of borderlessness, which is wicked, which is cruel. It's not empathetic. It's not kind. It's not compassionate. It actually kills. It kills. Um, Brian Kemp, he is the governor of Georgia. And I like Brian Kemp. I've had him on the show before. Good family. I'm sure he loves the country. I'm sure he loves the state of Georgia. So he wrote a strongly worded letter to President Biden saying your actions and those of your administration have resulted in every state in the country experiencing the disastrous impacts of an unsecured U.S. southern border. More than nine million illegal immigrants, he says, have crossed the border since you took office. And he talks about some of the terrible consequences of that. And then he talks about uh, Lake and Riley's uh, murder. And he is basically asking you know, President Biden to do his job. He says, frankly, Mr. President, your continued silence in response to these reasonable requests is outrageous. The American people deserve to know who is illegally entering our country due to your administration's failures and what risks and challenges every state must now face. He asks some questions. Why was my administration not made aware of the asylum claims and subsequent release of an illegal resident who presented fraudulent identification? He is talking about Ibarra. Uh, what is the current immigration status of Jose Antonio Ibarra? Why has this information not been been relayed to my administration of course we already know the answers to that and fine these are reasonable reasonable questions i am just over strongly worded letters i'm over it that's what republicans love to do they love strongly worded letters they love to have those fiery moments in the congressional hearing so that they can go viral but what's actually being done um i'll tell you what should be done um brian kemp needs to make good on his campaign promise to arrest illegal aliens, and to bust them out. Um, let me play you SOT1, which is from Brian Kemp's election campaign several years ago. Kate Steinle, Edwin Jackson, and the Cannon family, all killed by illegal immigrants. Donald Trump is right. We must secure the border and end sanctuary cities. As Secretary of State, Brian Kemp fought Obama twice and won to stop illegal immigrants from voting. I'll do the same as your governor. I'll enforce the ban on sanctuary cities and track and immediately deport all criminal aliens so our kids don't become the next victims. I have a genuine question. Is that being done? That's not rhetorical. I really want to know, like, is that being done? Is that uh, what is happening in the state of Georgia? Is he bussing the illegal immigrants out? Now, I would love them to be flown out back to Venezuela. But we can at least do what DeSantis and what Abbott did, send them up to the locales that voted to be sanctuary cities. Um, you can send them all to Martha's Vineyard. You can send them all to New York City. But as we know, somehow these illegal aliens are getting from one sanctuary city to the other. And I want to know how. How is that happening? What NGO is helping them travel because it's just a little random, right? It's a little random for someone like Ibarra to be in New York City, to be arrested, and to come to Athens, Georgia. That's random. Unless someone is telling him, hey, here are the cities available to you that have sanctuary policies that if you get in trouble again, you won't be deported, you won't be arrested by ICE. I'm assuming that's what's happening. I'm assuming that there is some subversive NGO that is, I'm sure, financially motivated by the federal government to protect these aliens. We know that's what's happening at the border. Many times these NGOs are picking them up. They're taking them to these sanctuary cities. And they have no culpability whatsoever when these migrants, when these aliens commit these heinous crimes. So I would just say, Governor Kemp, like, I'm a fan of a lot of what you've done. Um, I appreciate your statement. Let's do something, okay? Let's do something. Like, do you want another Lake and Riley? Do you want this to happen again? Why are there any sanctuary cities in Georgia at all under your watch? Should not every punishment be employed to these three sanctuary areas uh, to ensure that they cannot have any sanctuary policies? Like, what can be done? Surely there is a way to crack down on them, to remove some sort of funding and support, to put the pressure on them to ensure that they are complying with ICE. And I would just encourage you, those of you who live in um, Athens-Clark County, I believe that your 
representative is Mike Collins. I believe that that's his name. Bree can fact check that for me to make sure that I have that correct. Um, but I would reach out to him. I mean, he's a Republican and he's going to support what you have to say, but he needs to hear your voice. The pressure needs to be on him. The pressure needs to be on Governor Kemp to do something. The pressure needs to be on local officials. And even though she was not a UGA student, UGA holds a lot of power in Athens. If I were a donor to Georgia, I would get together with my other billionaire buddies and I would say, look, not another dollar to UGA until athens Clark County enforces the law. Enforces the law when it comes to immigration, enforces the law when it comes to crime. This should have happened a long time ago. Like we saw the influence that these millionaires and billionaires have over the universities like Harvard and the other Ivy Leagues when these very rich donors said, you know what, I'm not going to donate to you anymore if you continue to fan the flames of anti-Semitism on your campus. So that means that these millionaires, they could have leveraged their influence a long time ago to make these universities comply with sanity and morality. So I'm saying if you are a donor to UGA, you get with your rich buddies and you say not another dollar to UGA until something is done about these policies. And I understand the University of Georgia is not making these policies, but the University of Georgia has power. Without the University of Georgia, Athens is nothing. These politicians are nothing. And I know Athens is supported by a lot of liberal, brainless professors and students. But money talks, money talks. And there are a lot of rich conservative people that live in and around Athens. I would also say if you are a parent, and I know you want to send your kids to UGA. I know you do because you went to UGA. You're a UGA family. You never, you would never want your kids to go some, somewhere else. I get that. I totally do. I would say do not send your kids to UGA or to any university that's in a city that is not going to enforce the law for your kids' safety, but also just for principal. And you let them know. Why you are not sending your kids to Athens, Georgia. Why you, you will why you will not support the university. You will not support Athens Clark County. Defund sanctuary cities. Defund every district that refuses to enforce the law. Defund social justice. That's what I'm asking you to do for the sake of people like Lake and Riley. For the sake of potential innocent victims. This will keep happening until you use your money, until you use your voice, until you raise a respectful ruckus on this issue. And it's really hopeless and discouraging. It really is because people have been sounding the alarm about the dangers of illegal immigration for years and years. So I'm not so deluded to think that me talking about it on my podcast or even some people out there sounding the alarm about it, that that's going to make the major difference. But if you can just do what you can with the resources and the platform that God has given you, whether that's big or whether that's small, then maybe we can. Maybe you can just make a difference in Athens. Maybe you can just make a difference in Georgia. But until we do something, there will continue to be more Lake and Riley's. There will continue to be more Molly Tibbetts's. There will continue to be more Kate Steinleys. These are all young women in the past few years that have been violently murdered by men who should have never been here. Young women in the prime of their lives. Their lives robbed from them by people who should have not been here. And the blood is on the hands of every politician, left and right, who refuses to do something. People like it to be a campaign issue. Republicans love to keep this a problem so they can get reelected and run on this. Democrats, of course, are ideologically, demographically motivated to let this problem linger because these people eventually are going to turn into voters and they like the chaos and the anarchy um, that it, it causes. It is, I know people are like, ooh, the great replacement theory, it's so scary. I mean, Democrats talk about all the time that demographic, uh, demographics are, is destiny, um, that that is what is going to change the future of our country is importing voters that don't share the same Christian freedom-loving values that you and I have. I mean, it's a long game strategy and it's brilliant when you think about it. And so they don't really care if there's some innocent bloodshed in the meantime. It's all for the greater good. Progressive tyranny, of course. Um, so that's what's going on here. And I'm just so sad. I'm just, I'm so sad. I'm so sad for her friends. 
I'm so sad for the potential victims, for the future victims. They're inevitable. Like, we have a record number of illegal crossings. Terrorists, rapists, traffickers coming in over the border, and very few people are doing anything about it. Man, pray for our country. Pray for God's mercy and guidance and like some kind of just like miraculous conviction in the hearts and minds of the politicians who have the power to do something but but couldn't. It is Representative Mike Collins, by the way. He does represent um, Athens, Clark County. So I would say he's the person um, to reach out to and as well as Governor Kemp's office. Where are the buses, Governor Kemp? Where are the buses? Let's do what you said that you were going to do, what you ran on. Um, all right. That's it on that story. And, of course, I talked about it a lot longer than I was going to. But we are going to get into these uh, these other stories, even if it's a longer episode, because I just got to cover them. Too much going on. Uh, let me tell you about our next sponsor for the day. And that is a Focus on the Family sponsor. And that is a new podcast from Focus on the Family. And that is called Practice Makes parent. And I am super excited about this. Uh, Focus on the Family has been in the game for 40 years, encouraging, equipping, educating parents on how to guide their children in a godly way. And they are now introducing Practice Makes Parent, a podcast tailor-made for moms with toddlers and parents who could use a good laugh and some clear, practical, and biblical advice. It's hosted by Rebecca St. James, the Australian-American Christian pop rock sensation, and Dr. Danny Huerta, the brain behind Focus on the Family's parenting and youth initiatives. Each episode tackles real-life issues like communication, intimacy, money matters, daily stress. So this is really for your marriage. It's also for your parenting. There are new episodes every Wednesday on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcast. So go ahead, subscribe to Focus on the Family's Practice Makes Parent. Okay, everything that I just said there would be flagged by the good people at MSNBC and elsewhere as so-called Christian nationalism. I'm using big scare quotes for those who are just listening to this. And as we've talked about many times, this is something that is very loosely defined, but is consistently used as a mallet to bludgeon only conservative Christians. Remember, it's not Christian nationalism if, say, a predominantly black church is standing up there and saying that the Holy Spirit is using black magic to help Fannie Willis in her trial. It's not Christian nationalism if Democrat politicians are visiting these predominantly black churches and saying, vote for us. God wants you to vote for us. God wants you to give me power. God has given me power. And if you give me the power that God has ordained to me, I'm going to do X, Y, Z for you. That apparently is not Christian nationalism. But if a conservative says, hey, our rights come from God, That is, by the way, what the founders said, that we were endowed with certain inalienable rights by our creator. That's the Declaration of Independence. If you say, hey, I believe that it's wrong to kill babies. It's wrong for anyone to kill a baby in or outside of the womb. And yes, my belief that we are made in God's image, my belief in Psalm 139 that does motivate that. If you have a Christian understanding of the world and you bring that in to the public sphere and how you work and how you speak and how you vote, we are told that that is scary, dangerous Christian nationalism, that that is anti-democratic. Only if you are conservative Christian, if your Christian beliefs erroneously motivate you to vote for Democrats, to vote for abortion, to vote for anti-Christian ideals, then that's all well and good. Uh, Here is Heidi uh, Prezibaila. I'm not totally sure. Is that right, Brie? Prisabila. Um, she's on MSNBC. Brie doesn't know. I don't know either. Uh, she went viral on Thursday when she was asked about the infusion of Christian nationalism in Congress following the appointment of Mike Johnson as House Speaker. Mike Johnson, who is the House Speaker, he is, uh, I wouldn't even say he's like all of that conservative of a Christian. Like he was kind of repeating some BLM talking points a few years ago, but he has definitely talked about um, being an evangelical Christian and believing a lot of the things that you and I do. And I really appreciate how outspoken he has been about those things. And I totally agree with him on a lot of the things that he says, but apparently 
This is, for the first time in all of history, uh, in all of the history of America, very problematic and scary and tyrannical. So here is what Heidi said on MSNBC just a few days ago. The one thing that unites all of them, because there's many different groups orbiting Trump, but the thing that unites them as Christian nationalists, not Christians, by the way, because Christian nationalists is very different, mm -hmm. is that they believe that our rights as Americans, as all human beings, don't come from any earthly authority. They don't come from Congress. They don't come from the Supreme Court. They come from God. Oh, my gosh. That is so radical. That is so extreme. That is some new modern idea that we just came up with. That it's brand new information, in the words of Phoebe. Let me remind you of what the Declaration of Independence says. Let me just read it verbatim for you. We hold these truths to be self-evident, the founders said, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. Among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Now, Ms. Heidi is a Polk Award winner. She is a Pulitzer finalist. She is Politico's national investigative, uh, investigative correspondent. Um, and she is apparently a smart person. She is apparently an intellectual, somewhat of a historian. And she says the scary part of Christian nationalists is that we believe our rights come from God. Yeah, that's why any of us are here in the United States. The United States does not exist apart from that idea. So if that idea that our rights come from God is Christian nationalist, then the founders were Christian nationalists and America is a Christian nationalist nation. Is that what you are admitting, Heidi? Is that what you are saying? The truth is, the idea that our rights come from God is why she is allowed to say stupid things like that legally. Because we have the inherent right, the founders believe, to free speech and to worship who we want to worship and within some parameters, how we want to worship. We have the right to defend ourselves. We have the right to property. We have the right, first and foremost, to life because without the right to life, neither liberty nor happiness exist. And the reason why all of these have to come from God is because if they come from man or they come from government, then they're completely arbitrary. They're no longer innate. They no longer really belong to us. They belong to the government. And therefore, the government, if they are the giver of those rights, the arbiter of those rights, they then have the authority, the power to give them or to take them away as they see fit. But we believe, the founders believed, this was core to the creation of America, that only God, the author, has the authority to give us our rights, and therefore they cannot be arbitrarily given or taken away. That is core to what America is. But again, going back to our previous conversation, liberals don't even believe in an American identity. They resent the Constitution. They resent our founding. They hate our founders. They think it's all really null and void. And that progressive should have totalitarian control over everything. And then and only then can we have this beautiful, wonderful, empathy-filled nation, this multi-ethnic coalition where everyone just gets along. And it is anti-human nature. It is anti-biblical. It is anti-truth. It is absolutely absurd. And this is why progressivism fails. This is why the city is run by progressivism who are like, uh, pro-legalizing drugs, pro-legalizing homelessness, pro-legalizing crime and, and theft and all of these things. This is why they fail. It's why they're run into the ground because progressivism doesn't understand human nature because it doesn't understand where human beings come from. If you don't understand or believe in its creator, you can't really understand the creation. And that's why progressives just don't rule well. They don't dictate well. Um, and so that's where they're coming from. And it's a scary place because this lumps every single person 
into the scary category of Christian nationalism, which the intelligence community has already dubbed a terroristic threat, which, of course, is ridiculous. That's not where the threat of violence is coming from. That's not where the threat of terrorism is coming from. But they want to criminalize you for basic Christian beliefs. The only kind of Christian that they think is okay is the kind of Christian that is completely neutered, that may believe some things in their home about marriage and sin and abortion and all of that, but you can't actually represent those in the public sphere. It is not just anti-Christian. It is completely and totally anti-American. Do not be intimidated by this. And don't be intimidated by the lie that you and only you, conservative Christian, cannot represent your beliefs in the public sphere. Everyone else gets to. An atheist gets to vote in accordance with their faith, and they do absolutely have a faith. Um, every flavor of progressive, agnostic, uh, mainline Protestant, uh, they all get to vote in accordance with their worldview. Progressivism in itself is a religion. They all get to vote on this completely crazy, fantastical, quasi-religious belief that a man can become a woman. That's fine for them to bring their subjective beliefs into the public sphere. But when you, conservative Christian, do it, that's when you're a terroristic threat. Yeah, I mean, it's so on the nose when you look throughout history of, for example, Soviet Russia or Mao's China. It is so obvious what they're trying to do, but you can't be intimidated by it. Like, of course, I'm not saying that you embrace the extreme examples of what they're talking about that might actually be, you know, violent and terrible and all of that. But continue to be a Christian out loud. Be a Christian in how you vote and how you talk and the things that you do and how you work and how you enter into the public square. Absolutely. They're trying to intimidate you into complacency, into apathy, into silence. And you just can't do that. You just can't do it. Like lives depend upon it. Really, they do. I mean, we are voting against, we are standing against things like child sacrifice, which the church has always done. The church has always, everywhere we have infiltrated, every single society that we have stepped into, we have put an end to child sacrifice. We have said no more. And the Democrat Party today stands for child sacrifice, the butchering of children's bodies in and outside of the womb, whether it's through quote unquote gender affirmation or abortion. The least we can do as the church is what the church has always done, stood against child sacrifice. And you are the last barrier um, between them and total control and total utter depravity. So don't be intimidated by this stupidity. It is stupidity, but it's dangerous stupidity because these people not only have a voice, um, but they also have influence and they are influencing what the government um, <clears throat> what the government implements as far as policy goes and what they think about us and what the intelligence community is uh, planning to do, I'm sure, in an election year when it comes to those of us who want to raise our voice about things like immigration or freedom of religion or abortion, whatever it is. We've already seen what they are doing in arresting peaceful pro-life protesters. Scary times. I would say not only should we be reading the Bible on a daily basis, make sure that we are absolutely and totally equipped with God's word. But if you can uh, read some uh, Live Not by Lies, if you can read some Solzenheitsen, always get the pronunciation a little wonky. But if you can read a little bit of Soviet Russia um, and be prepared to not only live not by lies yourself, but don't let the lie triumph or be perpetuated through you what can we only do what can we only do the next right thing in faith with excellence and for the glory of god sometimes it's very public and loud sometimes it's very private and quiet sometimes it's just prayer sometimes it's just evangelism sometimes it's just changing diapers but sometimes it's speaking up sometimes it is calling your senator sometimes it's raising a respectful um and loud and relentless and persistent uh ruckus because lives are on the line Politics matter because policy matters because people matter. Politics affects policy. Policy affects people. And people matter. Christians know that better than anyone. Um, okay. All right. That's all we got on those two things. We are going to talk about just one more thing. 
end on a lighter note. We're going to end on a lighter note. Let's see. Have I done all my ads? Nope. I got one more ad. And then we're going to talk about what happened uh, on SNL over the weekend. I'll get some thoughts from Bree on that. I think it's actually kind of culturally uh, significant. Our last sponsor for the day, it's a great sponsor, just an awesome company with a really needed uh, service, and that is Covenant Eyes. Uh, there are a lot of companies out there working against you, your marriage, your family, uh, but here's one company that is absolutely on your side. Covenant Eyes has been the number one trusted software for over 23 years for Christians seeking to have a porn-free life. I know porn is an easy is not an easy topic to hear about or to talk about, but it has to be talked about because it's a silent killer of relationships, of self-esteem, of people's view of not just themselves, but others, of God, of church. It hurts marriages. It hurts your ability to be able to parent well, to work well. I mean, it can absolutely consume a person's life and it can and an absolute destruction for the individual who is trapped in porn addiction. And Covenant Eyes has tools and software available to help you battle that addiction. They've got a victory app with count, uh, powerful accountability uh, features built in and the optional blocking technology makes it an unparalleled tool in the fight to live a porn-free life. Go to covenanteyes.com slash Allie. You can download the victory app on all of your devices. Go to covenanteyes.com slash Allie. All right, comedian Shane Gillis hosted Saturday Night Live over the weekend, and he caused a stir. Um, SNL gave a platform to a guy that they had to fire several years ago because people had dug up some jokes that he made in the past that they called insensitive and misogynist, and I think racist was probably one of the critiques leveled against him. Now, I don't really, I'm not familiar with Shane Gillis, so I'm not defending him. I've seen a few of his things and a few of his jokes on my Discover page page on Instagram and um, it's been funny it's not your typical like progressive stuff and so I always appreciate people willing to go against the grain I'm not saying he is like a Christian or a conservative but there is something to be said about people who are willing to go against the progressive zeitgeist um, and so he came back after being fired from SNL in 2019 he came back to host the show so I'm sure he felt like uh, there was some vindication there, and he made a couple jokes that apparently didn't really land that well with SNL's more left-leaning audience. And so here is Saw 3. So my mom asked me, she's like, when did we stop being best friends? <laughs> and she's right. We used to be best friends. You remember that when you were a little boy and you, like, you loved your mom and you thought she was the cool? You remember when you were gay? <laughs> you remember when you were just a gay little boy? <laughs> Every little boy is just their mom's gay best friend. There's literally zero difference. Okay, so apparently the audience that was present actually did like that joke. But the chatter online was that, oh, my gosh, this is a homophobic, bad gay joke. He also has a bit about Down syndrome um, that he has told several times. I've heard it, and he shared it on here. Of course, some people called it ableist, and some people said, oh, it's all in good fun. He's not actually demeaning this group of people. Uh, but here is his joke about Down syndrome. Yeah, you can always tell who's never been around Down syndrome when you bring it up. Like, if I tell people, if I'm like, yeah, I have family members with Down syndrome, people that have never been around it are always like, oh. <laughs> like, it's, like, it's the end of the world. Like, oh, are they okay? Are they doing? It's like, they're doing better than everybody I know. <laughs> they're the only ones having a good time pretty consistently. <laughs> they're not worried about the election. <laughs> they're having a good time. He... He tells a joke about his uh, his uncle, Uncle Danny, I think, who has Down syndrome. And I'll just go ahead and tell the, like, maybe one of the most controversial jokes that he has. I'm not going to tell it like he tells it. <laughs> but he does a crossover of a gay joke and a Down syndrome joke. And he's like, you know, they say that gay isn't a choice, but all the guys I know that can't think love women. <laughs> That's when <laughs> he's talking about Down syndrome. I'm not. I am not supporting his joke. I am just saying <laughs> that is one of the controversial jokes that he tells. And it is, I mean, it's funny. It's funny. I'm not saying that we should sign off on like every bit of morality that a comedian represents, but it's a funny joke. It's kind of a clever joke. Um, 
He also joked about, uh, there was a cracker joke. I haven't heard this one. And apparently he got a big applause. So here it is. I'm not saying it's like something I'm looking forward to, but I think it'll be a nice thing uh, for the whole country. Uh, I would say when my niece is probably in like fifth, sixth grade, out at recess, and some white kids out there are like, hey, you're not allowed to play with us. You're retarded. And then uh, three black kids come flying out of nowhere. <laughs> Just start wailing on that cracker. Everyone's gonna be like, oh! It's like, it's like a nice moment. <laughs> okay, Bree, can you explain the context? Yeah, so right before that, he has described his sister's family, and she they, they adopted three little black boys, and then they had a biological child who has Down syndrome. So he's explaining that those that her three brothers would essentially be beating up the white kids for calling her the r word so oh. that was the context of that okay and gotcha. they loved that the audience loved that one. Oh, okay because <laughs> it was like black people against a white yeah. person okay yeah, seemingly yeah okay i know that some people will think that i'm like a fuddy daddy for this i am like anti r word i am so anti r word i'm not i know people call it like politically correct i just really hate it i hate the r word i just do you don't have to agree with me on that. But just, it's not like I go around using it. No, I, I know. I just I didn't want you to think that I was looking to you to validate me over there. Oh, no. But I just I hate it. I hate it. I think that it's so like, I don't know, degrading to a group of wonderful, wonderful people who actually some of them do suffer from mental retardation. Not everyone with some kind of special needs is. And that's what I also don't like about it is that everyone with special needs like autism, Down syndrome, Whatever it is, they're all kind of like put into that category of mental retardation. And then that like adjective is used to describe the world's worst things. And I just I personally just don't like it. So just FYI there. Don't love it. Um, the the use of that word. But I understand that this is an SNL monologue. And, you know, I do think it says something about SNL that they were willing to have someone on that has maybe a more conservative fan base, Bree. Again, he's not a conservative. He kind of jokes about, oh, I'm going to be a Republican soon, but I'm not yeah. yet. But SNL is so far left that I actually think it's kind of impressive that they had him on. Yeah, I know the the conversation before this aired, because they teased it a few weeks in advance. And um, yeah, the con- the conservative side was very excited for this episode. Just, I think, because he is willing to say jokes that, like, other comedians wouldn't. Um, and I don't even think the SNL, the people who produce SNL, liked this monologue. You can tell the band behind him is not laughing the entire time. Okay, but so. apparently they don't laugh. I saw that. Oh, I've seen them laugh before. At other oh, really? People's show. Yeah. Oh, okay. I'm not <laughs> Maybe a Maybe they're not supposed watcher. to. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, I'm sure that they don't share like the same values or even if they do, they had to keep it in they had to keep it inside. Yeah. It's controversial. Why do you think SNL is doing this? Why do you think that they're having back on someone that they fired for apparently being racist and homophobic? I think just because he's a big deal now. Yeah. I don't think it's like to make amends or anything. I think he got his Netflix special that was one of the highest viewed specials on Netflix ever. He's getting another one. Now he's getting a show on Netflix. He's a big deal and people love him. And so I think it was just for views. Yeah. Um, they had Nate Bregazzi recently. Yeah. He's my favorite. Love him. Love. Love. <laughs> he's not, he doesn't talk really like about politics or anything at all. He's just like a clean comedian. Yeah. He doesn't cuss. He doesn't talk about sex. I, okay, I, I went to one of his shows a couple years ago with my husband. I think that I have the biggest crossover with Nate Bregazzi. I mean, it was like, I felt like the biggest celebrity in the world because I went to a <laughs> Nate Bregazzi show. And I mean, honestly, and this is not how it is, you know, when I go just anywhere, but I mean, there were probably like 30 different people coming up to me like, oh, Ali Beth Stuckey, Ali Beth Stuckey. And I was like, wow, there must just be, it's like wow. the evangelical Southern Christian world. The Venn you love diagram. ABS <laughs> and you love Nate Bregazzi. Um, so yeah, hmm. that was really fun. And he was hilarious. There are not many things that can make me laugh out loud or like many comedians, even if I think it's funny, I'll like give like a, huh. but he actually makes me laugh 
out loud. Um, and his opener did too, but I can't remember his name. So, you know, I appreciate this. I appreciate SNL reaching out, getting some different kind of people. Do you follow Theo Vaughn? Yeah. You do? Yeah. He is very out of pocket. He's so out of pocket. <laughs> I don't even know if he could. Do you think he could host SNL? Like, I can't imagine what a monologue by him <laughs> would be. I think he could, but I don't. I don't know that I they would he let him because physically could. could. I'm, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> yeah, like, yeah. Um, do you? Yeah, think... no. I think he'd just be too unhinged. To be yeah. honest, you would definitely have to fill the audience with Theo Von fans. <laughs> You can't fill it with like a bunch of just random New Yorkers or else they're not no. going to there. I just don't know if they're going to get it. Yeah. He's such an interesting person. <laughs> yeah, I know. The most interesting person. <laughs> YouTube loves to feed me Theo Vaughn clips because. I've, I've laughed out loud at multiple ones that have just c popped up on my timeline. <laughs> well, there's zero. You can never guess how the clip is going to end. <laughs> yeah. That, like you start, yeah. he's talking about like a family reunion with his cousin, and at the end of it, he's talking about the most like I, I don't know out of this world subject, <laughs> and you're like, how in the world did we get there? I don't know. Yeah, it's part of his charm. Mm -hmm. Anyway, okay, I do think it's interesting how there's like this rising crop of like anti woke comedians, and even if I don't you know, agree with them on everything or whatever. I do think it's pro a positive development. Even like someone like Dave Chappelle and Joe Rogan being willing to talk about the things that they do. I think it's a good thing. There is like the comedian plays a very important cultural role in highlighting the absurd. And they can do more actually to change culture than someone who is just literally talking, I think, in a lot of ways. All right. That's all we got time for today. We will be back here tomorrow. Tomorrow is an episode of Wellness Wednesday. And so completely different change of pace. We're going to be talking about hormones and birth control and all different kinds of ways that women can remain balanced. Um, so I'm so excited for you to listen to that. We will be back here tomorrow.